For RCR TV, I'm Sean Kinney, and welcome to HetNet Happenings, where we take a look at all things DAS, small cell, Wi-Fi, and much more. Today on the show, we're going to take a look at a relatively new technology that's called MultiFire. Now, we've talked in the past about LTE and unlicensed spectrum, as well as its impact on existing Wi-Fi network deployments, which share that same unlicensed spectrum band. One iteration of LTEU is LAA, or Licensed Assisted Access, and this requires an anchor tenant that is deployed in licensed spectrum. MultiFire, in a big difference from LAA, takes that requirement away. It can be deployed solely in unlicensed spectrum. So today, we're going to learn a little bit more from Stefan Leitchens, who is the head of innovation steering at Nokia, as well as the chairman of the board of the MultiFire Alliance. And I think, you know, you have heard probably quite a lot about LTE and unlicensed. So we have LTEU, we have LAA, um, but this technology is a little bit different. So, so with the other technologies, you still need an anchor band to, to make it work. So that's basically, you know, using only the downlink and unlicensed and everything else is still connected to an anchor in license. What we did with MultiFire is, is that we said, okay, we want to enable different type of use cases. So can we disconnect the LTE uh, in unlicensed entirely from the license path? So we moved uh, both uplink and downlink in the unlicensed. We moved the control channels, the signaling channels. So everything that you need to build a standalone LTE network in the, in the unlicensed path. And I think that's kind of the key difference between um, what you see today and and if you then look at what does it bring you, um, it brings you the LTE functions like mobility, quality of service, better coverage than other, other technologies that are there in the uh, unlicensed band. Now that we've got an idea of what MultiFire is, let's take a look at a demonstration of the technology. I saw this demo earlier in the year when I was out at the Qualcomm headquarters in La Jolla, California. I was out there to meet with Rahul Patel, who is the SVP and GM of connectivity for Qualcomm. So this is a, a, a graphical representation of what exactly is a dense deployment. You have a large number of users and you take a look at how much is the uh, C2I or the interference over thermal. I think that's the one over there, interference over thermal or 40 dB. So uh, this indicates that it's a heavily interference limited system here. So the blue colors over here is where you don't have that many users, really it's thermal noise only, but here there's a large amount of interference. It's kind of a way of indicating that. Switch to just uh, disable that or right. click anyway. Just click it. Yeah, so that's the way just take this one out. Yeah, take it out. Yeah. All right, okay. Uh, it's exactly the same picture as before. Uh, it's a different mall-based environment and it's a slightly different uh, configuration. But the key point, as Sanjeev mentioned, is there is no licensed spectrum here at all. It's purely unlicensed spectrum at this point. Uh, there was a question on what is that P cell and S cell. There is no P cell. There's only one. Uh, there's no primary carrier. There's only one carrier here. And uh, we start off by just looking at bidirectional traffic. And as always, we're going to start with every user uh, using Wi-Fi. So in this case, instead of five, there are four sets of nodes. So it's a total of eight nodes, four access points, and four devices. Uh, they're all using Wi-Fi at this point. Similar KPIs again, channel utilization, stepwise, what's the two throughput, etc. But at this point, everyone is using Wi-Fi. And the sum rate, just like previously, we saw that before was about 40 megabits per second. It's exactly the same thing. Now we are going to. Where's the mouse? Ah, oh, there it is. I can barely see it. Ah, oh, there it is. Okay. So we're going to switch one of the nodes to MultiFire. And that's this one over here. 
So before we take a look at what happens to that node, let's take a look at the other nodes. All the other nodes, there are three more, uh, three times two, six of them, they're all using Wi-Fi. And you can see that their throughput is either the same or slightly better than before. So coexistence is still preserved. And on the other hand, the user who switched from uh, Wi-Fi to Multifier now has a higher data rate. Uh, this is both for downlink and uplink. By the way, each of these bar charts, there's like a slightly more solid and a darker region over here. That's the downlink and uplink split. No change in terms of channel utilization uh, characteristics. And uh, uh, it's a fair share of the medium. As you can see there, Multifire is fairly developed in terms of the technology, but in order for it to be successfully commercialized, there needs to be a market. So who is Multifire for? I put that question to Stefan. So if, we, if we start from the operator side, so, so the first use case is that it's simply indoor deployments, small campus areas, because for an operator, when you put in a small cell, you always still need to take a co-channel interference into account. And of course, if an operator wants to um, you know, deploy without too much thinking um, additional hotspot areas, you can use Multifire because it's entirely disconnected uh, from any kind of co-channel issues and so on. So for them, it's a very easy way to, um, uh, to deploy uh, additional uh, capacity in their network so they can augment. And secondly, uh, what they could also do, and this is also something which, for example, a neutral host can do or a shopping mall, uh, is that, you know, Multifire is a global band. Um, if, it, if we put it in 5 gig, we may put in another band. So it's also a, a network into which anybody can roam. So if you set up a multifire network in a, in a stadium instead of separate distributed uh, antenna systems, which is the case today, of course, it's a lot easier. So it's a lot lower cost um, and you can have uh, multiple business models around such neutral host network. And then if we touch on the enterprises, also for them, there are good opportunities. So, so they could choose to either build an entirely private LTE network. They could choose to uh, build a LTE network for themselves, but still uh, roam into an operator network once they leave the uh, premises. And so also there, you know, we see uh, use cases which might not have been possibly earlier by giving people a technology uh, which is more easy to deploy, either by an operator or themselves, with higher quality attributes than what is available now. The demo that we saw earlier in the show was publicly debuted in Barcelona at Mobile World Congress. Now, when I was there for the event, I had the chance to catch up with Monica Paolini, who is the president of Senza Feely Consulting, to get her take on the market niche that Multifire could potentially fill. Let's hear what she had to say. Well, Multifire, I forgot to mention that. Uh, it's, a, it's another possibility to use the, that spectrum. And that is uh, not for mobile operators, generally speaking, because in that case, you do not need a licensed band. So when you use a LAA or LTU or LWA, you need a, a licensed band as an anchor that does all the signaling. So signaling, unlicensed, data, licensed and unlicensed. You need both. Um, so the question is that if you want to take advantage of the LTE air interface in an unlicensed band, but you do not have license spectrum, then you can use Multifier. So it's the same solution, but doesn't require the license band for signaling. So everything is within the uh, unlicensed band. So that is a, a solution that it's more attractive for um, uh, operators that do not have access to um, uh, unlicensed band. So it would be independent service uh, network operators, cable operators. So there is a viable market for Multifire, but to get there, the technology really needs a strong advocate. And that's what the Multifire Alliance was formed to do. If we go back a little bit in history, how they started, I think, um, you know, both uh, Qualcomm and, and my company, uh, Nokia, we, we were working internally on this, uh, on this topic. And at some point we realized that uh, actually, you know, we're doing the same things here. And, and we also realized that, uh, um, you know, for this type of technology to take hold, the only thing you can do is try to foster an ecosystem 
And uh, I think uh, a good starting point to foster an ecosystem is, is to try to uh, collect other companies that could benefit from the technology uh, into a uh, into an alliance, with, uh, which is you know built on the basis of an even playing field with uh, very open IPR rules, but also some structure because in the end. So everybody needs to build the technology in the same way. You need to have interoperability uh, and so on. So, so we decided to set up the alliance. Um, in the end, we ended up with a, a, a group of four parties uh, to, to really lift it off. So Qualcomm, Nokia, Ericsson, and uh, Intel. And in the meantime, it's, it's slowly growing. And, and the interesting thing is, if you look to the members of uh, of Multifire, you can also see a reflection of, of the use cases that it can enable. So we see, for example, Ruckus is on board, we see which is coming from the Wi-Fi enterprise end. We see that Spider Cloud is there with their indoor perspective. We see companies like Atonet, which look very much into what can you do with wireless in, the, in mining, in you know this type of oil platforms, uh, specialized uh, enterprise areas. So, so you see it attracts a lot of people who see possibilities to do something with this technology that they, they couldn't do before. I mentioned a path to market for multi-fire. That's something that comes after the standard setting process runs its course. And here's Stefan to look a few years down the line. And then we will be looking at uh, uh, commercial trials during first quarter 17, followed by real products. Of course, each company has their own roadmap, but, uh, and, and they would need to you know, define it in more detail themselves. But uh, from our perspective, uh, uh, you know, in my Nokia role, that's uh, the uh, timeline that we are looking at. I'd like to thank the team at Qualcomm, as well as Monica Paolini and Stefan for taking the time to talk to me about Multifire. And I've got the complete interview with Stefan posted on the RCR Wireless News YouTube account. I'd encourage you to take a look at that as we delve a little more into potential Multifire use cases as well as Internet of Things applications. Now, speaking of IoT, I know our viewers are familiar with RCR and our website, but I'd like to take a moment to highlight a new project that we've been working on, and that's industrialiot5g.com. As the name implies, this new channel and community is dedicated to the Internet of Things, 5G, and all of the use cases, both current and future, that those technologies are enabling. We're really proud of it, and I'd encourage you to take a look. And in the meantime, for RCR TV, I'm Sean Kinney. Thanks for watching HetNet Happenings. HetNet Happenings is a production of RCR TV. To reach Sean Kinney or to suggest a show topic for HetNet Happenings, you can reach Sean at skinney at rcrwireless.com. On Twitter at Sean Kinney RCR. To find out more about the latest in HetNet and all things wireless, dig into rcrwireless.com.